I've been very much a part of the campaign for people's goals for sustainable development. Um, and uh, I guess we've been part of this process for the last two years since it started after Rio Plus 20. In fact, even at Rio Plus 20, we were involved. Um, and, and so, well, you, sh you saw the culmination of this process yesterday. Uh, very much a commercialized, hyped up launch uh, by the UN. Uh, of course, with advice from a professional corporate marketing agency, you know. I don't know if you've heard of, anyway, there are some backstories about that as well. But, but anyway, uh, definitely the, the UN trying to hype up the, the promise of these, this 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, uh, which is ironic because going back 15 years ago, during the Millennium Declaration, it was uh, unveiled, it's pretty much the same aspirations and hopes and uh, promises that were pledged by these same governments in, that, in those same halls. But 15 years hence, uh, we're faced with the same problems, if not worse. No? So uh, that is why f for, for us, we, we find a lot of um, reason to be cautious, uh, if not skeptical, of this 2030 agenda. And unfortunately, if you compare with, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people um, see, see the positive and there's a lot because if you actually read the text of the 2030 agenda in isolation there's a lot of promise in it right uh, and so so that's how we approached it we in terms of analyzing it we analyze it in terms of what they're saying in on paper and what what are the actual trends and practices of government policies you know and, and programs and if you look at that uh, it, it's what you just described, what's happening in India, the, the very aggressive privatization. Um, in, in, and, and one of the, I guess for me, one of the most, uh, uh, I guess, dramatic um, evidence of this, the dissonance between the rhetoric and the practice is you have the same governments prom promising these SDGs, which are, of course, non-binding. The same governments negotiating free trade agreements uh, like the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Transatlantic uh, Investment Partnership or TISA, you know, uh, which are binding, by the way, uh, but essentially erecting a global framework of rules that uh, allow global corporations to essentially veto laws uh, and regulations uh, that governments may uh, adopt or implement that would go against their bottom line. So in that context, how can you, how can you uh, see governments being credible in their pledges to achieve sustainable development goals and the realization of human rights and everything that they've been uh, lauding and applauding yesterday in, in during the launch of the, this 2030 agenda? I guess w one of the most troubling aspects of the 2030 agenda, and, and this was quite evident during the negotiations, is how uh, governments were raising ambition, at least on, on, in terms of goals and targets, but at the same time tenaciously uh, avoiding making concrete commitments in terms of financing, in terms of public financing. And of course, the justification is governments are in debt, uh, uh, we need more austerity, in fact, um, and, the, and given that the governments are, do not have the resources, then they have to resort to the private sector. Now, of course, by resorting to the private sector as the driver of this agenda, then you make private sector interests uh, primary in terms of uh, what's likely to be um, uh, prioritized in this agenda. Uh, and of course, they, they're doing it in a more... Uh, more seemingly acceptable way by packaging it as public-private partnerships but if they're public-private partnerships wherein it's the private sector interests that are dominant and primary then it doesn't matter if public is there in fact it makes it worse because in effect what what's happening is it's the private money providing 
financing, but public sector providing the guarantees, which are essentially prov uh, guarantees for uh, a certain revenue stream for the private sector. And if they don't achieve that revenue stream by charging users for essential services or, or using roads or using airports and seaports and all that, if they can recover their costs or, or their expected profits, then governments come in and provide the financing. Uh, in effect, what we're seeing is uh, a socialization of risks and a privatisa further privatization of gains, of, of profits. So that's, I, I think that's the most alarming uh, aspect to this agenda. Um, and of course, that means I think uh, that, that's why m many of the organizations that I work with uh, behind the Campaign for People's Goals, it's, it, our, 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 our hopes lie elsewhere. No? It's not in the very nice and lofty aspirations that are reflected in the 2030 outcome document. It's, it's really about um, how we continue to challenge the status quo. How do we continue to challenge uh, the, those who benefit from, from the current existing order, from the very unjust and unequal distribution of wealth and power uh, in the world? Uh, and that's precisely what is absent in the agenda. It's nothing about challenging existing relations of power or ex existing distribution of wealth. There's nothing about that. Uh, and that's why the 2030 agenda is not really transformative. It doesn't go beyond the logic of neoliberalism or of, of, uh, of uh, capitalist accumulation. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore, our, our work is not finished. It's, I guess it's never finished. We continue to, uh, to, ch to, ch to challenge that. Uh, and it's about people who continue resisting, organizing in the communities, uh, fighting land grabs, finding, fighting mining uh, expansion and plunder in our, in our lands. Uh, uh, making sure that corporations are held to account for the human rights violations and environmental impacts of their operations and of course government's complicity to that. Uh, so that is where hope lies. Civil society needs to uh, continue engaging governments and uh, in, in making sure that they're held accountable for the promises that they have made. Um, but of course it more most importantly it's, it's about how do we build power from below and that we do uh, through of course our collective action through our organizing through our popular education and through our collective actions uh, in 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 as i said in challenging those who are who are in power i guess my well, in a nutshell my 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 message to governments is that if they're if they're sincere in the promise of leaving no one behind uh, I think uh, we have to recognize that people are not just left behind but are actually pushed back by the current mode of development. And, and it's that uh, growth-oriented, market-led, private sector-led mode of development that we must leave behind if we want no one, to, no person in the planet to be destroyed by, by uh, the, the, the current system.